Okay, good evening, good afternoon. On behalf of the Moss Program and Trinity University, let me welcome you to the second event in our 2014 Alvarez and Lennox seminar series about uh, Ch the Chilean New Song movement. Uh, today we have uh, Juan Pablo Gonzalez uh, from Santiago, Chile, uh, here to uh, talk to us about his work uh, in this field. I'll leave his introduction to my colleague, uh, David Spiner. My job here really is to welcome you all uh, to the event. Uh, a special welcome to, of course, our Trinity community, faculty, students, staff who are here. We're always glad to have you. Uh, to community members uh, from sort of friends of Trinity, friends of Mass, uh, from uh, off campus, uh, that we always love to have you all uh, here with us. And a special welcome to someone in a group that I forgot the last time, which is the International Studies Program. And all of you International Studies uh, colloquium friends and Professor Nanette Lacote, uh, Director of International Studies, uh, who's been a great supporter of MAS over the years. And I don't know how I could have forgotten you all, but I did the first time, so a special welcome to all of you. Um, so at this point, uh, I'd like to invite my colleague David Spiner to come up to introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, again, welcome. Thank you for joining us for our second lecture in the Chile Canta Mundo series. Uh, don't forget that there are two more exciting events scheduled for this week. On Thursday night, Elizabeth Moris and Jose Seves will be sharing with us the songs of the godparents of the Chilean new song movement, Violeta Parra and Victor Jara, at 7 p.m. in the Parker Chapel here at Trinity. That event is free and open to the public, and no tickets are required. Uh, so uh, try to get there yourselves and tell your friends. Then on Saturday night at 8 o'clock, Elizabeth and Jose will be performing a concert of their own music at the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center at 922 San Pedro Avenue. Um, we are passing, or you should have flyers in front of you about that event by these two wonderful and internationally acclaimed musicians and singer-songwriters. Tickets are just $5, and they may be purchased from the Esperanza Center or by stopping by the Office of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology here at Trinity. We also have some tickets for sale with us here this afternoon. So if you are interested in buying tickets, see Ara Navarro, director of our own MAS program. Uh, and you can guarantee yourself a seat at the Esperanza that way on Saturday night. It could sell out, so it might be a good idea to get a ticket ahead of time. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to a dear friend and colleague, Juan Pablo Gonzalez, who has come all the way from Santiago, Chile, to share his knowledge and wisdom with us this afternoon. Juan Pablo Gonzalez received his BA in musicology from the Universidad de Chile and his PhD in musicology from the University of California at Los Angeles. He was the founder and first president of the Chilean Society for Musicology and the Latin American branch of the International Association for the Study of Popular Music. He currently directs the Institute of Music at the Universidad Alberto Hurtado in Santiago. In addition, Dr. Gonzalez serves on the faculty of the Institute of History of the Catholic University in Chile, also in Santiago. Professor Gonzalez's research focuses on 20th century popular music in Chile and in Latin America, contributing to its understanding in socio-historical, socio-aesthetic, and in analytical terms. Along with his many articles published in international scholarly journals and his regular contributions to the El Mercurio newspaper in Santiago, he is the co-author of En Busca de la Musica Chilena, In Search of Chilean Music, and of two volumes of Historia Social de la Musica Popular in Chile, The Social History of Popular Music in Chile. His latest book is Pensar la Musica desde América Latina, Problemas e Interrogantes, Thinking About Music from a Latin American Perspective, Problems and Questions, that just came out in 2013. In 2003, he received Cuba's Casa de las Américas Prize for Musicology, and in 2010, was awarded the Bicentennial Medal of the Chilean Council of Music, an organization affiliated with UNESCO's International Council of Music. Professor Gonzalez is with us today to set the stage for the musical performances that will take place here in San Antonio later in the week. His lecture, which he will deliver in English, is titled, 50 Years of Chilean New Song. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Juan Pablo Gonzalez. Thank you, David. Uh, I want to thank the Trinity University and his, his wonderful community that I meet 
yesterday and today, students, professors, friends, and Mass, a wonderful project, putting together all the Hispanic world uh, which meet here today. Well, I will read, I will play some music, I will show you some slides, and then uh, we'll have some time to, to interact with each other. Uh, I will refer to Nueva Canción Chilena, new Chilean song, as NCC, because I repeat a lot this name. Well, Nueva Canción Chilena is a musical movement that emerged in Chile in the mid-1960s in the context of movements for social and political change within the country and beyond. Part of a widespread development okay, mm -hmm. yeah, which saw similar musical trends develop in Argentina, Uruguay, and Cuba in the 1960s Nueva Canción Chilena differentiated itself from those trends by integrating influence from other Latin American countries to a greater and wider extent. Let me see. I hope at the end of the lecture we will understand this, this slide, but we will we'll be, going back to this slide uh, several times, the portion of this slide. NCC articulated influence from the vast Andean territory, from Argentinian Nuevo Cancionero, Uruguayan Canto Popular, Cuban Nueva Trova, and the folk music of Colombia, Venezuela, and Mexico. In this way, NCC musicians not only manifested the ideal of Latin American integration that was widely present in the 1960s, but also reflected the need felt by Chilean musicians to compensate for the lack of African-derived elements in Chilean culture and the minimal presence of Amerindian influence in Chilean folk music two element highly appreciated by NCC musicians. Another way in which NCC differed from other popular music genres in Latin America was that instead of developing from a long, marginalized, and anonymous historical process, its existence was predicated on the work of a specific author authors living in Santiago and had become recognized as such within a few years of its inception. As such, it, it had to generate its own production system. Because of this, NCC may be seen not as a genre so much as a musical movement in which an uh, innovative trend in song making developed and was disseminated alongside social and political trends that were also innovative and progressive. NCC received its name in 1969 after the first of the three annual festivals of Nueva Canción organized by this jockey Ricardo Garcia in Santiago. But the Latin American musical blending that was on of its basic features had already been developed by Violeta Parra, beginning in the early 1960s in her work in Paris, Santiago, and Concepcion. For example, Parra's fam famous song, Gracias a la Vida, Thanks to Life, is based on uh, a genre of Hispanic origin from the south, the far south of Chile, but it was composed and performed on the Bolivian charango, the little uh, string instrument, which became Violeta Parra trademark instrument at that time. Now, I will put a, some example. Uh, 
okay, you are not supposed to play that kind of rhythm in the charango. So that's happened for the first time, that you, you take one instrument from one tradition and play a, a genera from another tradition. That was the example that I want to, to show you. Okay. over here. A second funda fundamental characteristic of NCC present from its early stage was its en engagement with social content, which was given a political impulse by the election of the le left-wing government of Salvador Allende in 1970. NCC's, NCC's political orientation developed in the early 1970s with the support of universities, political parties, and the government. With the military coup of September 1973, NCC musicians went into exile, developing careers in Europe, supported by an international movement that sympathized with the Chilean cause. With the return of democracy to Chile in the late 1980s, the exiled musicians also returned giving back to the country all the experience and recognition they achieved abroad, but also finding a country with different social priorities and a new generation with differentiate, different musical interests, more oriented towards rock and pop. Take a look at the historical background of New Song. When folk music, folk music of Hispanic origin, was absorbed by the incipient musical industry of the 1920s. A mainstream Chilean genre, later called typical music, was born. The upper classes supported typical music because it represented the Western, Catholic, and white heritage that they wanted to impose in the country. As urban immigration in Chile increased by the mid 20th century, musica tipica came to evoke the lost paradise of the countryside. There we go. Mac computer, but anyway. <laughs> um, meanwhile, a new trend in folk music was being developed in Chile uh, and elsewhere. A revival of all genera and repertoires from folklore called Proyección Folclórica, folk projection. The incorporation of remote genera into urban music practice in the Proyección Folclórica of the late 50s introduced figures from rural and marginalized areas, areas of Chilean society who were previously distant from the concerns of performers and listeners. Performers began to favor reference to this type of subjects rather than focusing on autobiographical narratives or reference to the listener. Such subjects were also absorbed into mass culture in the early 1960s by neo-folklore, a musical trend based on vocal arrangement 
developed by the recording industry to modernize folk music for a new youth audience. This is the Cueca, the Chilean national dance. Anyway, the movement for the integration uh, of the Latin American continent, influ influential uh, throughout the century at political, economic, and cultural levels, manifested itself strongly in the 1950s and 60s. This heightened the dissemination and adoption in Chile of music from other parts of Latin America and increase exposure, exposure in Chile to songs from all over the continent, especially those of singers and writers such as the Argentinian Atahualpa Yupanqui, the Uruguayan Daniel Viglietti, and later the Cuban Silvio Rodriguez, who were themselves engaged in the renewal of the popular repertoire and traditional song making of their countries. Latin American song had arrived in Paris at a time when the French capital was becoming the European center for Latin American culture. When Violeta Parra and her children Angel and Isabel were living in Paris in the early 60s, they became familiar with this repertoire and took it back to Chile upon their return in 1964. Also, the recording, broadcasting, and stardom industries of South America which had already been in interconnected for 20 years, placed it at the disposal of the new mass-mediated folklore and network of business people, radio station, labels, and record distributors. The first NCC ensembles appeared in 1965, at a time when the interest in neo-folklore among Chilean youth was at its peak and the music was receiving good press and music industry support. In this environment, the folklore boom served, served to foster the early development of NCC ensembles. However, as this group developed more explicit political agendas, and as the political climate within Chile became more polarized, the media and much of the music industry ignored them in the late 1960s, leaving NCC musicians to seek the, uh, to base their development on an alternative to the mainstream industry. Meanwhile, by, meanwhile, by, by 1968, the folklore boom in Chile had passed its peak and the romantic pop song in Spanish, Italian, and French, and rock in English, had reached their peak of popularity. Aware of the obstacles to mass market penetration, members of NCC group maintained their status as university students, and in this way received support from their academic and political environment. Both the expansion of NCC and the university reform process were fed by the expectation of change aroused by the program of revolution in freedom of the Christian Democrat government of Eduardo Frey. 
this expectation were expressed by the defense of Latin American cultural independence against the cultural uniformity perceived to be encouraged by the United States during the Cold War. NCC proved itself too radical for Chile's media and music industry, which at the time had settled into a pattern of loyalty to repertoires that had become entrenched, such as typical music, or to the new phenomena that originated within the music industry, such as neo-folklore and the rockabilly trend of new wave, Nueva Ola. For these reasons, NCC not only received low coverage in the press, but also attracted little airplay on radio and television, despite being well represented by majors and minors recording levels. By 1971, around 70% of radio stations in Chile were keeping their distance from President Salvador Allende, an ally of NCC. This further restricted the dissemination of NCC, with, uh, which was compelled to find its own way. It did so by developing new performance spaces, such as the Peñas Folclóricas, folk clubs, organizing song festivals, and obtaining funding from government and universities. These accomplishments were achieved with the support of left-wing sectors of society, as well as that of the university environment, where NCC most loyal artists, fans, and promoters could be found. The Peña Folclorica provide an intimate space in which the distance between the performer and the audience was minimized. These peñas were managed by the musicians themselves, as were the Chilean casas de canto, songhouses of the early 20th century. They also, they also exist at the universities which result in the institut institutionalization of the common student activity of getting together around the guitar to sing and play. The informal nature of the Peña Folclorica meant that musicians could, could, could interact with their audience and try, and try out new songs that might let, later be recorded. Ensembles would also visit the peñas in search of new repertoire, approaching the composer directly to ask them for songs that might have been debuted that very night. As of 1969, DCAP label was also selling its releases at performance of its artists at peñas folcloricas, universities, and labor unions thus setting up an alternative distribution system that had not intermediaries and functioned parallel to the established record industry. Two years, two years later, the label IRT, the nationalized form of the former RCA, began following the same model. In this way, because NCC was primarily disseminate through live performance and in cultural and political circles, enjoy little radio and television airplay, and avoid the star system in favor of the songsmith, it did not fit well into the concept of popular music as it had been conceived in the 20th century. Instead, it was more akin to folkloric and art music, which were similarly restricted at the level of distribution. The catalyst for the consolidation of NCC as a movement was provided by this jockey, Ricardo Garcia, who in 1969 obtained funding from the Catholic University of Chile to organize the first NCC festival. This festival which took place three times up to 1971, was not associate, associated with the music industry or the press, 
was not sponsored by any radio station label or publication and did not have industry representatives to vouch for it. This factor enabled the festival to break with the prevailing idea that song festival ought to be competitive and commercial. Instead, it created an alternative platform for the professionalization of deep music, which helped consolidate it as a movement that was to prove of central importance in the subsequent history of popular music in Chile and Latin America. A little about, are you understanding me? I'm, I'm sorry I'm not fluent in my English. Uh, 20 years ago, I was in LA, but then I living in Chile, I, when, when David go there, we speak in Spanish, and I didn't have the possibility to practice with him. But, but anyway, you understand him, that is important. NCC, uh, music and lyrics, the music and lyrics. NCC development included input from both solo artists and instrumental groups. The solo artists composed their own songs and later came to be known as cantautores, singers and writers. Chilean cantautoria, singing songwriting of the 60s, had its roots in rural peasant song and poetry, drawing for, from the Argentine and Uruguayan cantautoria of the time, but also developing its own characteristic based on many different influences, local as well as from a number of Latin American countries, as we have seen. Along with Violeta Parra, the most important artists are on the slide. This is not the, the year that the year that they were born as cantautores, not as a human beings. Violeta Parra and Victor Jara came from different creative spheres but share a common interest in imbuing popular music with Chilean and Latin American folklore, experimenting with language and interweighing music with drama and dance. I like very much this picture. It's not well known by, of Victor Jara because it, it, uh, it, 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 it was printed in a in a magazine for children that I collect. So when I was eight year old or 10 year old, I got the, the, that magazine, you know, probably I, I don't put attention. And later doing research, I would, would see my old magazine and I found this, this, uh, this wonderful picture by Victor Jara with this guitar, you know, with red spray, you know, and something more modern for him. Uh, in their songs, Chilean cantautores made little use of local folk genre. Instead, delving into wither Latin American repertoire to find new genre that they could blend with total freedom. Familiar with the hegemonic 6 8 plus 3 4, pam 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 pattern from Chilean folklore. They adopt genera that had similar methods, such as the Argentine samba, the Paraguayan guarania, and the Mexican huapango. Let me show you, uh, let me, uh, Patricio Mans uh, is, is uh, a wonderful of our uh, singer-songwriters, uh, a song by him, you can feel the 6-8. The Not too much. Oh. It's, ah, probably here? No. Probably here. Ah, here. Sorry. What happened? You know, Mac are better. <laughs> Probably again, everything again. Thank you, David. You stop the, the clock, please. 
Ah, here, of course. Por nacimiento, un día la bebé allá, cabellos color de trigo, casos claros, pisos de pan. Al mirarla comprendí que me había de Patricio Mans uh, is in the middle, Angel Parra and Rolando Alarcón. In addition, the links between Chile and Cuba in the 1970s allow the cantautores to learn about, about Cuban genre and incorporate this into their songs. Both the Chilean cantautores and the NCC groups also broadened their repertoire with songs from the Mexican Revolution, the Spanish Civil War, and the political songs from the United States. Will Chilean cantautores uh, support and collaborate with, uh, with one another, and because they live off their work, were able to establish NCC as a professional option. NCC ensembles, by contrast, were student groups who turned their, their work into a professional after they went into exile. The main uh, uh, ensembles of NCC are on screen. Most of their names are in indigenous language as an expression of empathy with the native peoples of Latin America. All of them wore ponchos a distinctive clothing, clothing of the native, native people of the Americas. The histories of each of these groups were intertwined, intervened with that of the NCC and involved permanent dialogues with the cantautores in terms of aesthetic, ideology, and production. NCC groups were supported by the professional cantautores who served as their artistic directors and taught them to play Latin American instruments and songs, and by composers who wrote and arranged for them. The NCC groups injected new energy into folklore-based popular music in Chile taking neo-folklore's use of the guitar to new levels and adding many Latin American instruments to their ensemble with a clear Andean primacy. Though the Andean region encompasses a wide variety of local cultures and language, the Andean mountains themselves have served as a natural path to integrate that diversity. The Inca and the Spanish thus transformed the Andes into the dorsal spine of South America, through which both Quechua and Catholic influence spread. This influence came from the common threads of the music and culture of, of a vast region which covered the north of Chile and Argentina, most of Bolivia, Peru, and Ecuador, and the south of Colombia. As a consequence, throughout this whole area, we find descending pentatonic scales, scales predominant binary rhythms, spelling tempos, common indigenous mestizo and western instruments, the practice of carnival and the worship to the Virgin Mary and patron saints. The features of Andean music running through NCC symbolize social and cultural unity in Latin America 
and the championing of indigenous expression. For international audience, Andean music act as a major signifier of Latin America in general, and little by little, it came to be adopted by NCC group. A charango, a bombo, Argentina and bass drum, and a kena, flute, were all that was needed to play a vast repertoire, repertoire that drew nations together and demonstrate solidarity with those excluded from modernity. What is more, Andean music served as the central core of Latin American music as a whole in terms of its performance in Europe or the United States to a public interested in the tradition of the continent. This is a wonderful video made by Inti Yimani for the Peruvian television when they were in, still in the exile. Just as neo-folklore groups from the early 1960s became known for their vocal arrangement, NCC groups became known for the instrumental arrangement. Their members not only play the many different Latin American instrument names above, they also use them in two ways by following traditional practice and by exploring new use and sonorities. In this way, the ensembles develop fusions of Latin American practice, genres and instruments to produce the distinctive sound that constituted an important aspect of NCC legacy. Victor Jara instrumental work La Partida, The Farewell, for instance, recorded by Inti Gimani in 1972, is a score for kena, charango, two tiples, two standard guitars, bombo, tambourine, maracas, claves, and tubular bells, mainly instrument of Andean, Creole, and Caribbean origins. Jara also used this unusual blending of instrument from different cultural setting in a non-idiomatic fashion. This is the charango. The Colombian tiples. Thank you. 
Okay. Here we go. Relationships. I will just uh, something on the lyrics, but I will go uh, quickly because of time. Relationships. The NCC movement was also involved in theater and the visual arts, developing its own progressive aesthetic within mass culture. Graphic design acquired new social meaning with the development of posters that became collectibles within youth culture, incorporating reference to California hippie culture and Cuban political pamphlets. In Chile, one important graphic arts workshop was the of the Larrea brothers, who produced numerous record covers, poster designs, and photographs of NCC artists giving expression to their new style of design. This style incorporated elements of pop art, psychedelic art, social realism, and high con contrast photography. Record covers, LPs. as well as local influence, including political muralism, primitive xylography sign, and historical photography. As part of its mingling with the artistic world, a central element to understanding the NCC phenomena was the relationship that it established between popular musicians and conservatory trained composers, be it, in, be it in the form of mutual learning opportunities or ideological commonalities. The focal point of this intersection was the evening musical school of the University of Chile where people of all age with no prior musical education could, uh, could attend cl classes given by the main composers of the time. Eager to broaden their audience and incorporate elements into their music that will link them with society in a more direct manner, Chilean composers of the mid 20th century enter into productive relationship with NCC. In the late 1960s, these composers began producing large-scale popular works, often in collaboration with NCC groups. The performance of this work allowed for new levels of interaction between the oral and the rhythm, and between the creative process and the performance, establishing a new means of working that has continued to be used in Chile into the 21st century. The preferred format for this work was the revived Italian secular cantata of the end of the 17th century with its arias, duets, recitatives, and choral textures. Thus, at the end of the 60s, a process began that brought an antiquated music form already revived by neoclassical composers of the 20s, closer to popular music, using it, using it to relate historical events and pay tribute to well-known figures within the artistic and political world. The first of these works, and the most important because of its staying power and subsequent influence, was the cantata Santa Maria de Iquique, 1970, by Luis Advis and the group uh, Quilapayun. We will listen to listen the, the last song of the cantata. <laughs> Escucha 
Okay, very powerful. They have, you know, they have a rock version now of the cantata where I don't like it. I mean, I, they say, well, it's good for the new generation. I think that the new generation, you know, should, you know, appreciate it, the, the original version. Well, I'm getting old. But you don't need rock music for this. I don't know, probably. Uh, uh, Los Tetas is the name. Okay, um, of, the, of the band. Here. The vocal ensemble of NCC was more robust and had a more homophonic texture than that of neo folklore, since it did away with the soloist, in this way creating a collective and cohesive sound that reflect the concept of unity of the people promoted by the NCC group. Within this uh, climate of affiliation with art, Popular musicians move uh, de decisively towards the creation of instrumental music with high levels of sophistication. Three factors came together in the rise of instrumental music within the context of NCC. The existence of, of instrumental music in Andean culture, which fed strongly into the NCC movement, as we have seen. The use of instrumental music as incidental music for theater and dance and exploration of the possibilities of the guitar, the NCC central instrument. Because of this recept receptiveness to song from all over Latin America and its, uh, its affinity with the world of art, NCC acquire, acquired cultural and learned overtones. This, along with its link with political ideologies of the 60s, attracted the attention of intellectual circles, both within Chile and abroad. In this way, even though NCC did not achieve mass acceptance in the way Musica Typica did, for instance, uh, with the passage of time, it became the source of more written discourse and reflection than any other, any other popular music of Chile. Finally, later development. The military coup of 1973 led to the death of Victor Jara and the exile of all other NCC artists. Until the late, until the late 1970s, these artists engaged in political activism abroad and fully expected to return home. By the early 1980s, the exiled NCC artists had begun to unpack their bags and integrate into the European circuit. In this way, they continued the, to work uh, on the project of developing and renewing folklore that they had begun in Chile, and in so uh, doing rich high levels of artistic development. In Tijimani and Kilapayun incorporated Mediterranean influence into the mix and augment their own repertoires inviting classical and popular musicians to create, perform, and record with them. These groups achieved full recognition in the European scene of the 1980s, doing so with the support of an international audience that sympathized with the Chilean political cause and to which the musicians offered their synthesis of Latin American music and highly professional performance. With the end of Pinochet dictatorship in 1988, most of these exiled artists returned to Chile, where they were warmly received by their home audience and reintegrated into Chile cultural life. However, new social, cultural, and political scenarios and the change in musical orientation of the new generation left NCC musicians without all the media coverage and the public attention that they, that they deserve. A new way of understanding folk roots was to mark the renewal of the national music scene in the first decade of the 21st century. Continuing the trend of Chilean musicians and public of incorporating world music into their practice and consumption. 
Those responsible were a third generation of Chilean singer-songwriters who came on the scene in the 2000s, such Ellie Morris, that you will hear uh, Thursday night, uh, Manuel Garcia, Chinoy, Nano Stern, and Camila Moreno, among others. For these cantautores, folk roots do not need their own particular land or soil. Rather, they are hydroponically fed by a mediated and universal folklore. Let, let me show you an example by Manuel Garcia. With this generation, roots began to be a personal choice rather than a collective heritage, generating social networks of personal choices that find in music its most effective medium to knit communities from margins and divergence. Thank you very much.